Welcome to Condo Insider on Hawaii, Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Attorney Nalan. Joining me today is our guest, Laurie McGuire, uh, partner at Quarter McGuire uh, Keokona Law Firm. Uh, she currently chairs the Legislative Action Committee of a Condominium Associations Institute Hawaii chapter. Today, we're fortunate to have Laurie join us for a discussion on the legislative bills that have or are about to become law in Hawaii in 2023 legislative session, which will impact condominium associations in Hawaii uh, and also plant community associations. Aloha, Laurie. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Na, for having me. I appreciate it. I heard uh, the Legislative Action Committee has been really busy this session, and now that uh, like dust has settled a little bit, and uh, tell us a bit about where we are as far as the timeline, the legislature. Okay, well, the governor has until June 26th to veto the bills, and uh, you know thereafter we will know exactly which bills are going to be signed by him or which will be allowed just to come into law. I see. But we do have one, uh, you know, act that has already been passed already this year, right? And it is kind of unique because it, it was passed with the two-thirds, uh, you know, uh, way to overrate it. So uh, can you uh, help shed us some light on that? Sure. Yes, that was actually pretty exciting. Um, this is uh, Senate Bill 921. And uh, the purpose of the the uh, the bill is to amend Chapter 514B, 141C, and it involves the uh, statute of repose. And it allows condominiums a reasonable opportunity to assert legal claims once the period for developer control has terminated. You know, previously associations had only 10 years. Uh, there was a 10-year statute of limitations in order to bring a claim against a developer for construction defect. Well, uh, as a result of Senate Bill 921, um, now associations have, pardon me, two years from the uh, termination of developer control to bring their claims. And as you know, this bill was actually vetoed by the governor. It's my understanding it was the first bill he ever vetoed. And then the um, both the Senate and the House were able to override that veto, which was a, a wonderful thing, I think, for condominium associations. So for our, you know, like a non-attorney audience out there, can you help us, uh, you know, explain a little bit about the difference between statute of limitation and statute of repose? Okay, um, the uh, statute of repose actually extinguishes a right of action after a period of time has elapsed. Uh, a statute of limitations is a limitation brought on certain types of actions so that, uh, for example, let's say a, a breach of contract action, that has a six-year statute of limitations. So from the time a party has breached a contract, the other party who is damaged by that breach has only six years to bring a claim against the party who breached the contract. So that's the statute of limitations. I see. So let's use an example. I mean, a typical construction defect lawsuit for those, especially for those new condominiums, right? So mm -hmm. homeowners uh, will have claims against developer and general contractors, all the subs. But, you know, usually you won't discover about this problem until sometime after you leave there right. for a certain period of time. So previously, this 10-year statute of repose would cut off your rights if you don't take timely action. But with this new law, that, that means that uh, condominium associations, homeowners now have more right against, you know, developers or contractors who caused, you know, construction defects in their project. Is that exactly. correct? Yeah, because you cannot bring an action so long as the developer remains in control. You have to wait for developer control to terminate. And so what has happened in the past, at least in certain circumstances, is the developer control has gone beyond 10 years. And therefore, if there were any construction defects, then those owners 
could not bring claims against that developer because the 10 year statute of limitations had expired. Thank you. Let's move on. Now, I think the next session, we're going to cover the bill of all these bills uh, that are pending governor's action. You know, as Larry just explained, they were enrolled, uh, they passed in the, uh, you know, House and the Senate, and they were enrolled to the governor. So the governor has until June 29th to consider whether to veto or uh, to sign. And then, you know, of course, uh, you know, there's a process, you know, either the governor signs, it becomes the law, or, you know, if within time frame the governor does not veto, they could also become law without the governor's signature. And then there's the veto, and then there's also possibility Senate and the House could choose to, you know, override, right. uh, which is rare, as we just discussed. Mm -hmm. So these are, you know, bills that could or, you know, likely to become law in this session, which will have impact on the legal compliance for your condominium projects and planned community projects. So let's cover the first one, which is HB 1509. Uh, what is this bill about? Okay. Well, this bill actually um, establishes two task forces. And uh, the first task force is established, uh, or rather establishes a planned community, community association oversight task force. And they will be looking basically at chapter 514B, which governs condominiums. Well, planned uh, community associations are governed by chapter 421J. And just to give you an idea of the problems, 421J contains less than or approximately 25 different statutes, as where the condominium chapter contains well over 100 different statutes that cover uh, just the, the gamut of, of issues and areas, right? And so what this task force is going to do is look at all of the condominium law to see if they can uh, extend that law to apply to planned community associations to provide uh, these planned community associations with more tools, if you will, to work with, to uh, give them more authority, more power, um, more uh, assets, if you will, uh, in order to um, implement the various issues that condominiums have access to, or assets rather. Yes. So I guess for our audience, you know, it, these, you know, condominium associations are basically created by statute, but usually for a planned community association, that's really based on the declaration of CCNR, which is a restrictive covenants running with the land. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a, they are a little bit different, you know, for, you know, planned community associations, if they incorporate to become a nonprofit corporation, then of course, they can also utilize the nonprofit statute for their governance. Right. So overall, you know, but, you know, there's also concern about the reason why the state had the resources to uh, sort of help or overseeing these condominiums actions is also because every condo unit will pay into these funds through the biannual registration, right? So right. does that mean, you know, if they do uh, want to set up a new agency to oversee planned community associations, then the state will also start charging planned community association homeowners in order to have the funds to, you know, uh, carry all this additional duty. Possibly, yes, that's definitely being discussed. That is one of the things that they're talking about. So, for example, um, condominiums, one of the things that the second task force that's being implemented is charged with doing is looking at condominium associations and all of those issues, right? And they also will be looking at the various um, uh, dispute prevention uh, issues that are involved in condominiums, such as mediation, binding arbitration, non-binding arbitration, uh, efforts to settle cases before they actually get into court. Right now, um, planned community associations have access to some of that, uh, but not near as much as condominium associations as to where condos have access to the um, education trust fund, the condo education trust fund, right? And yeah. that funds various mediations and other um, 
other items, it's also going to now fund these task forces as well. So, um, you know, these task forces are doing these studies. They have to issue an interim report to the legislature mm -hmm. 20 days before the 2024 session begins. And then a final report to the legislature 20 days before the 2025 legislative session ends. So I anticipate that most likely um, the 2025 session may include new laws that gradually start to bring provisions that you can now find in 514B governing condominiums into the Plan Community Association Chapter 421J. I see. So we'll find out in the next uh, legislative year, I guess. Yeah. So let's move on to the next one, SB 729. And this one is regarding condominium board leadership training. And what is this about? Yes. Uh, well, this actually expands the powers and the duties of the Real Estate Commission mm -hmm. because they've now been assigned by the legislature to develop a curriculum for leadership training for various members of boards of directors. Um, so, for example, this particular training is going to include um, things they need to know about HRS uh, 514B. That's the chapter that governs condominiums. Uh, it will include uh, standard provisions of the various governing documents as well as the fiduciary duties of uh, board members uh, as stated in 414D, which is the nonprofit statute. And for example, um, boards, all board members have a fiduciary duty to act in good faith, right? Yeah. Um, they are also supposed to act in uh, a manner that's consistent with the director's duty of loyalty to the association. Um, they're supposed to act in a manner uh, that, where the director reasonably believes to be in the best interests of the association. So the concern that was conveyed to the legislature by various constituents was that boards were not um, as informed as they should be about the law and about the governing documents and their fiduciary duties. So the uh, legislature entered into a compromise because others were against this, because the concern is if board members are required to uh, obtain an education about certain things, the concern is maybe more board members uh, or rather more owners won't apply for the board. They won't seek to get appointed to the board. So they're looking into it to see if, uh, if they can develop additional resources for these board members. That being said, currently, if you go on the website for the Real Estate Commission, uh, you will find lots of educational tools for board members. Yes, and we actually had a session with the, you know, condominium uh, education specialist earlier this year. I think uh, we covered a lot of the resources, including, you know, the trendy like short video that meets everybody's attention span these days. Yes, exactly. Right. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, let's move on to uh, the next one, SB 855. And this okay. one is a very important new law. It's regarding the condominium budgets, uh, reserves, and especially, uh, you know, regarding the Honolulu County's fire safety uh, compliance rules, right? Yeah. Uh, can you help uh, explain further about this one? Sure. Uh, this bill was actually promoted by Senator Fukunaga. She was the one championing this bill. And um, it actually amends 514B 148 concerning budgets and reserve requirements. And it um, mandates that condominium associations now shall provide a summary of the required information in its budget. And it authorizes a condominium association's reserve study to forecast a loan or a special assessment to fund the new life safety requirements. So now reserves have to contain funding for these life safety requirements now required by the city and county of Honolulu, right? And so we're talking about um, 
potential sprinkler installations, or if you've had this life safety evaluation, you know that there are certain condominiums that are uh, in, in lieu of installing sprinklers, um, making other changes to their buildings to um, make them safer. So for example, I know a number of them are putting in new fire alarm systems. I mean, there's about, I think, 17 different components that have to do with this system. I do know, though, that before Senator Fukunaga came back to the legislature, she was on the uh, city council and she was able to get this put on hold for now mm -hmm. uh, because of the outcry from condominium owners that they just could not afford these changes at this time. So um, this, is, um, this is being implemented to allow associations to uh, have these requirements and fund for these requirements, but uh, they can also um, forecast loan a loan for the to fund these and also a special assessment for that purpose so definitely more transparency and disclosures required for potential buyers who want to buy into a certain condo project right that's a good news oh, yeah. for those buyers yes, for sure. definitely and definitely. you know like as we just mentioned the initial law was you know passed the fire safety law in honolulu was you know passed in 2018 and i think uh well, with the initial compliance cutoff deadline, that's kind of unrealistic. With so many buildings, they weren't prepared financially for such a huge, expensive projects. And I think that compliance uh, deadline keeps getting, you know, postponed, mm -hmm. given all these, uh, you know, outcries made by the public. I think right now, under the ordinance uh, 22-02, the current time frame uh, that's given to the associations is like 13 years from May 3rd of 2018. So basically before, you know, May 3rd of 2031, right? There are not that many years left. And with this bill, basically it gives the alarm to all these associations. They really need to start saving towards that if their project it is subject to this rule, this law, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise they won't be able to comply. Right, right. Well, and another thing that this rule has in it, or rather this um, this statute has in it, is that um, now if associations are not funding a particular capital improvement requirement, they have to state that now in their uh, reserves, in their uh, budget and their reserve study. So, and they have to state why it, it's been omitted. So for example, in the past, associations weren't including um, funding for their pipe replacements, right? Mm -hmm. And that's because they, you know, they were thought to last 50 years as opposed to 20 versus 30 years, right? So yeah. now that has to be included, that information. If it's not included, you've got to state what's not included and why it's not included. So that's very important because I think a lot of associations in the past have not included critical components. And also, uh, I think clarifies that, uh, you know, because they do have the requirement that associations reserve study now needs to be done by like an independent uh, professional. And yeah. they clarify that, you know, associations managing agent who has the ability to do it is able to do it. And that's not a conflict of interest. That's a good thing to clarify. Yes, right? yes that's, uh, you bring up a good point because I noticed this session, you know, last session they amended this bill too and there were requirements. So they, they uh, came back this session and tweaked it. And now they have a definition for this independent reserve study preparer. And it means any organization, company, or individual with a reserve study certification from an industry organization. You know, previously they talked about this independent reserve study preparer, but nobody knew what that meant because there was I no see. definition for it. So and reserve awesome. study, I'm sorry to cut off, like, so reserve study uh, specialist, that's a designation usually done by community associations institute, like the trade right. organization, right? Yes. I yes, see. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, now that brings to, you know, the last one we're going to cover in this category, you know, because associations as uh, are also employers, you need to mm -hmm. comply with uh, employment law as well. This yeah. one is update on employment law, which is SB 1057. And uh, what is this one about, Larry? All right. Um, well, the purpose of SB 1057 is to 
reduce pay inequalities. And this particular bill requires certain job listings to include now an hourly rate or a salary range. The idea is to get the information out there so that you're not going to have people uh, applying for jobs that don't pay what they're looking for. And, and that way, you know, it also promotes transparency. Everybody can see everything, including the current employees. They can see what the employer is now offering to the new employees. And that way they can uh, go to the employer and seek a raise if they feel they're qualified. Since they're paying this new person who hasn't done the job yet, a set fee, assuming that amount is higher than that particular employee is making. So uh, it, it equalizes the field, so to speak. Um, it also prohibits an employer from discriminating between employees because of any protected class, protected category uh, established under the law by paying wages to employees in an establishment at a rate that uh, less than the rate at which the employer pays wages to other employees in the establishment for substantially similar work. So there again, they are leveling the playing field, uh, making sure that persons in a protected class um, are now covered and can get the same uh, pay as anyone else doing that same job with the same qualifications. I see. But there are some exceptions, right? Not every position is subject to this new requirement. Right. Yes, that's true. Um, hang on a second. Let me look here. So um, I know that, for example, if you're an employer and you have uh, 50 or more employees, or I'm sorry, 50 or less employees, it does not apply to you. If you are a public employer and your employees utilize a collective bargaining agreement, it also does not apply to you. Um, and also, if you are an employer and you are uh, promoting someone within your company, let's say, or, or lateral moves within the company, it also doesn't apply to that situation. Yeah, so uh, you just covered those uh, protected categories from employers' discriminatory practices. I mean, there's one that's very kind of unique is the arrest and court record, right? Mm -hmm. But I think the condo statute does have a special right for condominium hiring, like association employee background check mm -hmm. that is in uh, HRS 514B133. So um, usually for managing agent, resident managers, security guard, you know, because these right. people have got to do the daily, uh, you know, encounters with the, all these residents. Uh, so the association is allowed to conduct a background check before right. they make a decision to hire someone. Yes. And that's not illegal. That's that's totally fine, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Well, they're going to be, you know, that person is going to be working with all the owners and, you know, the various residents, their children, et cetera. So, yes. They need to they need to know the background yeah we have about five minutes left and then we're gonna cover a little bit about uh, uh you know some resolutions passed in the legislature this year uh so before we start we want our audience to have a little bit of understanding about what is a resolution and what's the difference from a bill oh gosh now that i did not look up i know a bill is going to become law a, a resolution um, is is uh, I'm looking at it as a an urging. The legislature is urging that uh, uh, it's like a policy, and they're urging that the parties abide by this particular policy. Um, so you know, for example, one of the resolutions I think we were talking about was um, Senate Concurrent Resolution 48, for example, mm -hmm. and um, the purpose of that particular resolution. Uh, and the intent of it is to request that the insurance division uh, conduct a uh, study analyzing whether the implementation of a captive insurance system in this state that is modeled after Massachusetts captive insurance system may provide an alternative uh, to traditional condominium property insurance. Uh, at a time when insurance uh, uh, in the state of Hawaii, the rates for condominium insurance is just skyrocketing. So, uh, you know, the, the people have been crying out to the legislature and the legislature is listening and looking for alternatives because unfortunately, 
Um, we've had a number of uh, insurers that have left the state. And so our, uh, our availability is uh, decreasing quickly. Yeah. And also, I think as part of this resolution, the legislature actually mentioned uh, part of the reason is caused because of the fire safety compliance rule yes. that's in place. Right. Uh, I expected a consequence on uh, the pricing tag. Anyway, uh, we also have two, like a sort of a very similar uh, resolutions passed. It's all regarding, you know, educations of the condominium boards. And right. they're really emphasizing more education on like several, uh, you know, issues, uh, echoed in both, uh, you know, the HR 106 and also concurrent resolution as CR 124. And what are these uh, six, you know, uh, areas that the legislature want the DCCA to develop, uh, you know, uh, or educate uh, the condominium unit owners and board directors about? Sure. Um these, both of these resolutions are basically, they say the exact same thing. They're concurrent resolutions. And um, the first one is they want, uh, they want associations uh, to be educated concerning, and when I say associations, I'm talking about both owners and board members on effective condominium governance practices, uh, including the importance of maintaining open and frequent communication. Uh, in the legislature, you'll often hear people testifying about um, they, if they, you know, they can't communicate with the board. The board won't give them uh, an opportunity to talk at the board meetings, et cetera. So the legislature is concerned about the ability to communicate. And they want to improve uh, the communication back and forth between the owners and the board. Uh, another area is uh, the purpose of the governing documents and how they guide condominium management. Uh, you know, if everybody would read the governing documents, it would simplify matters because owners would know what they can and cannot do. Board members would know uh, what they can and cannot do as well. And, you know, both groups need to know this information. Uh, another was uh, the obligations of unit owners and board members. That also is found in the governing documents. Um, the interplay between regular assessments, reserves, uh, capital improvements, and special assessments, uh, as well as uh, any other matters related to the uh, effective administration of the association. And then lastly, uh, the dispute resolution process. They want uh, owners and board members to be familiar with that process and, and including the, the mechanics of both mediation and arbitration, uh, because as you know, uh, owners are utilizing both of those processes more and more, as opposed to filing a complaint and going in court, you know, before a judge. It's very costly, and uh, mediation, certainly for condominiums, uh, is is much um, much cheaper because. Uh, in many instances, it's subsidized by the Condominium Education Trust Fund. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Larry. I think we've covered all and our time is almost up, but I understand there is actually a webinar uh, put together by your organization, Community Associations Institute Legislative Action Committee. Uh, can you, this is your time to advertise for this event if for our okay, audience today. Sure. Yes. Um, Yes, LAC, the Legislative Action Committee for CAI, it will be putting on a seminar on July 27th, 2023. It will be a webinar, um, and we uh, we will have this information going out. I believe it's already gone out, um, but it's in the process. Um, we're putting it all together now, but we will be talking about all the new laws uh, that have passed. And by then we will know which laws have passed and which laws haven't passed. And, um, you know, we'll also talk about the laws that keep coming up over and over and over again. And we'll be talking about... Um, Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. 
You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.